Good morning. Uh, I want to thank Lily for inviting me once again this year to the um, the talks that are occurring here in geriatrics, and I appreciate the invitation. Appreciate you guys being here. And today I'm going to talk about the clinical advances um, for osteoporosis. So may I have the first slide, please? There it is. Okay. Osteoporosis, as you may know, is a disease characterized by the loss of bone mass. And in addition to that, there's also a loss or a breakage in the microarchitectural uh, struts in the bone so that it increases the risk of developing fragility fractures. And of course, you can tell by looking at by the first slide that the slide on your right is, of course, osteoporos osteoporotic, and the slide on the left is a normal bone. We, of course, think about osteoporosis as a disease of women, but it can occur in men as well. It affects 28 million Americans. There's around 1.5 million fractures that occur per year, and they're, of course, predicted to be much more in the future. And not to mention there's a big health care burden, cost burden, uh, that we experience because of osteoporosis, not only with more, the mortality, but also with morbidity in the hospitalizations and long-term care associated with it. It's a disease that's asymptomatic prior to fractures. You don't know you have it until you break something. And this is comparable to, let's say, the blood pressure, uh, having a stroke. You don't know you have high blood pressure until you have a stroke. You don't know you have high cholesterol until you have a heart attack. And so we really need to then measure or determine who's at risk for osteoporosis so we can intervene in the prevention of the fractures. And the most common sites for fractures include the spine, the hip and the forearm. So if any of the patients experience these fragility fractures, not that they're involved in a motor vehicle accident, but if they just all of a sudden break something, you have to think about osteoporosis. Now we measure bone mineral density by using a technology called a bone mineral densitometer or a DEXA, dual energy x-ray um, absorptiometry, and we can measure then um, bone mineral density in grams per centimeter squared. What determines the bone mass are two things. One is the age, the peak bone mass that one occurred, that one attained during their growth in adolescent years. So that's one factor. 80% of that is determined by genetics. So that's why it's important to ask if people have family histories of osteoporosis, because chances are they may not have obtained their peak bone mass during growth in adolescence. Also asking about factors that would have affected their attainment of this peak bone mass, for instance, if they were sick when they were growing up, or if they um, were immobilized for some reason, or if they had amenorrhea, let's say in women, if they were sick and did not have periods uh, for a long period of time. In addition to the peak bone mass, the age and rate at which bone loss occurs is also a, uh, the determination of the bone mineral density. And again, people can start losing, we typically think of one losing bone mass at menopause, and you can lose anywhere from 2 to 5 percent per year in the early menopausal period. Men, however, can also lose bone with age, however, it's much less, it's around less than 1 percent per year, and women after the menopausal bone loss, does, they do um, start losing bone at less than 1 percent per year or around 1 percent per year. This just shows you the normal bone uh, attainment during growth in adolescent. It peaks at around the age of 30, and then it decreases after that. Uh, and it occurs in both sexes, as shown in men in blue and women in pink. Now, when we make the diagnosis of osteoporosis, we do that based on a peak bone mass. So therefore, we use the um, uh, T-scores and um, to compare to a peak bone mass. So if someone has um, a bone mineral density that's less than 2.5 standard deviations below a peak bone mass, then they con are considered to have osteoporosis. If it's between 1 and 2.5, it's osteopenia. So what are these T-scores? If you recall the normal bell-shaped population curve, you have your mean plus or minus 1 and 2 standard deviations on either side. If it is two standard deviations, then you capture around 95 percent of the population. So really, we're looking at people that are less than minus two standard deviations below this mean or the average bone mass for, that, um, for uh, someone at the age of 30. And again, viewing it another way, you turn the little bell-shaped curve on its side. And again, osteopenia is between 1 and 2.5 and osteoporosis less than that. 
So this is an example of one of these DEXs that we do get. Uh, it's a poor quality. Um, scanning it in still doesn't do a good job many times. But if you look at the spine over there on the left, and then you look at the graph on the right, the graph is plotted in age on the X and bone density on the Y. And that asterisk in the middle marks the patient. Um, there's a lot of shaded areas on that, and I'm not quite sure how it came out on the handout, and if you can really see it on this, but uh, the shaded, the, the bold lines that go down, um, horizontal down the graph, correspond to one standard deviations. Then the kind of curvy linear line is um, the bone loss that one sees um, over time. So the peak bone mass uh, at 30, those bold lines are the standard deviations below that peak bone mass. And so with her, she is above um, the minus 2 mark, and I wish I had a pointer, but you can see the first, the shaded area, the first line, and then that second line, and she falls between those two, so she's at a minus uh, 1.13. Uh, standard deviations, but she's between those two. So she has a diagnosis of osteopenia. And likewise, we then measure the hip. Um, the, we usually do a total hip, however, you can also just concentrate in on the femoral neck, which is of course where most of the fractures occur. But the reports nowadays come out with the total, uh, give you a total bone mineral density measurement, and that's more important for when you follow with the bone densities, you can compare better if there's been an actual change because you're measuring more points. The more ends you measure, the better producibility it is. So how does this correlate with fractures? Because again, that's the major outcome that we want to um, determine if this is really a good prediction of who's going to fracture. And it's been shown that for every standard deviation down, your risk of fracturing increases by two to three fold. And likewise on the slide, or how it is um, comparable to blood pressure and to cholesterol. Many, many causes. We always think of menopause and aging, but there are a slew of other causes. And this is important when someone is not responding to therapy, when they're fracturing on therapy, when they're way low off the graph, you know, there's something else going on, and so you have to think of these other causes um, that can result in a low bone density. There are two slides set aside for this, so again, many things, and I won't go over the individual ones. They're sort of talks in, them, in and of themselves, but it's just for you to have and to kind of refresh to know that there are other things to look for. All of these causes affect this bone remodeling unit. This is a normal bone remodeling unit that occurs throughout the skeleton in everyone all the time. It takes out old bone, puts in new bone. It's resorption followed by formation. And there's always osteoclastic bone resorption that occurs first, and you need that in order to then form new bone. This is important to know that all the therapies we have for osteoporosis prevention and treatment affects the osteoclast. They don't form new bone, except for one that just came out recently in the New England, and I do have some of that data on one of these slides that we can talk about. So in addition, in addition to all those different diseases, there are a number of factors that put someone at a risk for osteoporosis. Of course, if someone already has a fracture, then that puts them at a risk. If this fracture's in a first degree relative, then you know there's a family history of osteoporosis, and so that's important as well. Low body weight, if they went through premature menopause, they're more at an increased risk than if they're just going through menopause. Cigarette smoking, and these other ones, the dementia, the impaired vision, poor health habits, not so much that they cause a low bone density, but they increase the risk of falling and fractures. So that's why it's important to note those. So therefore, they are considered risk factors uh, for osteoporotic fractures. There are many drugs also that can affect bone metabolism. Anticonvulsants interferes with, the, of course, the P450 system that then increases the metabolism of vitamin D. So it makes the vitamin D inactive. And so many of these individuals are vitamin D deficient. So what do you do if someone comes, this is a 60 plus year old lady who comes in with a T-score of minus 2.2 on her spine. Sort of expected bone loss that you would see for her age and her sex. 
you expect her to have lost some bone if she has not been on therapy. Again, it's not 100%. If it was 100% of people lose bone, then we should just put everything in the drinking water and then be done with it. But not everyone is going to lose bone. But she's it's kind of expected then. So here she is, age 60, and she's osteopenic. So what should you do? Should you have to look for secondary causes? Probably not, but you do want to do a basic look work up, making sure she doesn't have renal insufficiency, liver function abnormalities. Asymptomatic hypercalcemia, hyperparathyroidism is a very important cause for bone loss. And again, getting a, looking at the serum calcium is an easy way in screening for that. The 24-hour urine collection, I tend to do to assess a calcium balance. So if the calcium in the urine is too low, mean my cutoff is less than 100, then I really push on the fact that they should have more calcium intake, whether it's by the diet or supplements. So it's pretty basic. Everyone pretty much gets, you know, at least people that come see me who are older, 60, they have this sort of workup in their, you know, they come with that already. So it's not that I, you know, have to spend the extra money to, um, to work, you know, to say, oh yeah, you know, you probably don't have anything big going on. Again, history and physical is always important, looking for the other subtle endocrine causes or those other causes um, that can um, lead to bone loss. Now, what if this person comes in? Again, I know this is a geriatrics conference, but this is a younger individual who's around 46, and she comes in and her T-score is minus 3.2. So she's real low. So with something like this, this does not, I mean, yes, she went through premature menopause around two years ago, but it should not have, a, have resulted in this loss of bone. So you really have to think of something else going on. And that's when the full workup should be done with PTHs and vitamin Ds. And possibly S-PEP, U-PEP, looking for myeloma, although she's not really in the age category there. And then a 24-hour urine cortisol, if there's a slight suggestion that she may be hypercortisolemic with little Cushing's. In this case, this lady had a vitamin D abnormality and was malabsorbing, had secondary hyperparathyroidism, and so that's why she had the low bone density. And you would not want to treat that then with just estrogen or bisphosphonate as I come to the therapies. Vitamin D and calcium is the treatment for that, which segues into what are the fundamentals for um, prevention and treatment of osteoporosis, adequate calcium, vitamin D, and exercise, and of course to avoid the risk factors. And this is not just at the time of menopause. This is throughout one's life. So again, it's real concerning for adolescents these days to be drinking all the Cokes and Colas and not drinking their milk. And I love those milk commercials within, as with Pete Sampras and of course the U.S. Opens, I mean the French Opens going on right now, being a big tennis buff, this is one of my favorites. Um, so the milk commercials I really like. And not only do they get the calcium, they get protein and they get phosphorus, all very important in bone metabolism. And yes, you can cut back on the fat then by doing the 2%. And if people are lactose intolerant, they have the soy milk and it has the same amount of calcium in it. And now we have fortified orange juice with calcium. And so there's a lot of ways of getting it. I always recommend diet first, and so take a diet history and see how much they, they obtain. 300 milligrams per serving of dairy product is what I usually, I don't memorize all the different milligrams per serving, but 300 is a good estimate for milk, for cheese, for yogurt, for ice cream, 300 milligrams. And so then what you need to do is that make sure that they have adequate um, calcium with the supplements. So you don't have to put everyone on 1,500 milligrams of calcium with a supplement with a pill. Again, just supplement based on what they get nutrition-wise. Uh, calcium carbonate is 40% elemental calcium. Nowadays, they are putting the milligrams of elemental calcium on the bottle, so you don't have to keep that in mind, but in the past, they weren't. So if you took 1,250 of calcium carbonate, everyone thought I was taking enough, you know, you were taking enough, but that's only 500 milligrams of elemental calcium. Um, Tums is a great way of doing it, at least for people who don't like to take the big horse pills, which some of them are pretty big, so you could just chew the Tums, and it comes in three, four different strengths, the regular, extra, ultra, and in the vitamin section, you could buy a big, huge Tum like this that has 500 milligrams in one Tum. Uh, and so that's good. What's the difference between carbonate and citrate? Probably nothing. People think that the citrate is maybe better absorbed in people who are anchlorhydrics, um, who, who 
who don't make a, enough um, acid in this stomach, but they're the same. So whether you get it in either one or the other, it's the same. Now the vitamin D, the take home point here is that most elderly are deficient in vitamin D and that the recommended daily allowance should be 800 to 1200 units, international units per day, not 400 like their RDA recommends. For, for an elderly person, it should be higher. Uh, and so that, we don't have those doses though. So I usually tell people to take two multivitamins uh, a day and that gives you 800 international units. And then the calcium supplements, many of those are fortified or, or added with um, vitamin D. So it's usually 125 international units per pill. Anyone wants to guess how much vitamin D is in a quart of milk? Around 400, but you have to then drink a quart of milk. And I don't know how many people, but if you do, you get your calcium and your vitamin D at the same time. Important thing, do not put people on 50,000 units of vitamin D. 50,000, that's way over. That's pharmacologic, awfully over the amount that you need. Um, don't put people on that every day. Uh, once a week is how it should be dosed, and it's usually only given in people who are vitamin D deficient. And just in the last year, we've had two patients come into the VA hypercalcemic, the VA hospital hypercalcemic, because even though they were prescribed 50,000 once a week, they were taking it every day. They were like in their 70s, 80s. And they came in vitamin D toxic and they, and they both died. And it's just because it's long, you know, like a three month half-life of the vitamin D in the, in the system after it gets. So just be cautious with this 50,000. But it's kind of amazing. All we have is like the 400 and then we have 50,000 units. Um, we don't have anything in between. The other two um, preparations of vitamin D um, you probably don't need to prescribe unless someone is of course vitamin D deficient, whether liver abnormalities or kidney problems or rickets or the other forms of vitamin D deficiency. And once again, just a reminder for everything health oriented to avoid those unhealthy habits of drinking and smoking. So what about the treatments we have? These are the, the treatments that have um, are FDA approved for both the prevention and therapy of osteoporosis. And I'll include the recent one, the parathyroid hormone administration, um, the one that just came out, although it's not FD FDA approved. All of these therapies, estrogen bisphosphonates, the selective estrogen receptor modulators and the calcitonin all affect osteoclast. They do not build new bone. When you look at the studies, you'll see that they do increase bone density, but they don't build bone in and of themselves. They can't just take a slab of bone and build up on it. Fluoride can do that, but the problem with fluoride was that then there was an increased risk of fractures because you added more bone that was not good strong bone to already bone that was already osteoporotic and so it caused more fractures. So you have to be careful when talking about whether these anti-resorptives, what they're doing is in terms of building new bone. So you can read this as well as I can. Everyone knows about estrogen. The receptors are located on the um, osteoblast. When you remove estrogen, cytokines are released from the osteoblast that stimulate the osteoclast to resorb bone. And so if you, we give back estrogen, it blocks those cytokine release and it decreases osteoclastic bone resorption. There are other advantages. The big one is of course the hot flashes and symptomatic relief. There's now all sorts of questions that have been raised regarding cardiovascular protection and of course the breast cancer issue. And so I think estrogen is the first line in an early menopausal woman who you're intervening in the prevention of bone loss. But if someone has, is older and they've never seen estrogen, chances are they have heart disease. Estrogen may not be, if it's only for bone, because we have now other agents that are, are definitely better for bone. But if you're using estrogen for other things like symptomatic relief, then I think it's a, a, fine, a fine drug. And this shows the increase, and again, I say that tongue in cheek because we know they don't form bone, but there is an increase in the bone density, both in the spine and the hip, when you use estrogen. 
the bisphosphonates, the first generation were, was a tidronate. It's been around for as long as estrogen has, around 50 years. And it's um, been shown to prevent osteoclastic bone resorption. And how these guys work is that they get deposited into the hydroxyapatite crystal of the bone matrix. And then when the osteoclast bone resorbing cells chew up that bone, it's taken up by the osteoclast and it kills them. So that's how it works. It's a direct toxic effect on the osteoclast to destroy them. Once these bisphosphonates get in bone, the only way they come out is if the resorption occurs. Because they're half-life in bone, they just stay in bone. It's like a tetracycline, you know, it just goes to bone and it stays there forever until it's resorbed out. Important thing to take it in the morning, empty stomach, full glass of water, can't eat or drink anything for 30 minutes, and it's relatively contraindicated in someone that can't stand or sit for the 30 minutes after they take it. So many nursing home individuals who are bedridden probably should not have the bisphosphonate as part of the therapy because the major side effect is a GI, bleed, esophagitis, gastritis, gastric ulcers. And that's probably the only side effect, although I get other complaints um, regarding it as well. Um, but that's the major complaint. Um, we also have uh, alendronate is what's been FDA approved for prevention and treatment in just this March. Residronate or actinil has been approved both in the prevention and the treatment. And I told you what, um, just went over that, it's activity. So this shows how, again, alendronate increases bone density up to around um, 5%, 4 Five percent in the spot in the hip, and around seven eight percent in the spine. Uh, but with longer term, this is over three year period. But with longer term therapy, there's no further really no further increase. So that's the max. And really, when we want to see increases in bone density, with a in, with a bone forming agent, we want to see twenty percent increases. Take them from that minus three up to normal. These don't do that. Um, there's also a once a week dosing of alendronate that's been FDA approved. You just give it once a week. And again, going through the song and dance that you have to go through when you take these medications, this is good for many people. We only have surrogate marker data of this. We only have the bone density data. We don't have fracture data on the once a week dosing. And I'll show the fracture data uh, of all these uh, treatments in a moment. This is the effect of residronate, actinil, the new bisphosphonate. On the market, it pretty much does the same as alendronate, perhaps less potent um, than the alendronate, but the fracture data looks as good. And then what about the selective estrogen receptor modulators? The first generation for that was tamoxifen, and now we have verloxifene or Avista. Uh, we have three-year data out looking at bone density, and also the beautiful thing about um, this um, agent is that it decreases the risk of breast cancer. The drag part is that we only have three-year data. And if we think about the adjuvant uh, therapy for the treatment of breast cancer with tamoxifen, you stop using tamoxifen after five years because there's no really improvement in uh, survival if you leave them on tamoxifen for any longer. And the, the concern is, is it going to select out for estrogen receptor negative breast cancers? That is to be determined. And I think we just need the long-term studies on that. Because remember, estrogen studies only, I mean, that's only been looked at recently, and that's been around for 50 years, about that slight increased risk of breast cancer. Just a little caveat there, no long-term studies. Calcitonin, very benign drug, but also not a very good drug. And it hasn't really been shown that there are any good fracture data with calcitonin. And I think it's because people develop a resistance to it. It's probably good acutely. It has an analgesic property. So someone that has an acute vertebral fracture, it's nice to try that uh, on them to see if that helps with some of the pain relief. But I think long-term use of calcitonin for osteoporosis is not really um, a, the best choice. However, if someone can't take the bisphosphonates and you know, sort of at a last, last resort, then sure. Uh, something is better than nothing, although many of my colleagues feel you're just wasting your money using the calcitonin if you really want to look at bones. Now, parathyroid hormone. This is the newest one that just came um, 
who just published, not FDA approved yet. And of course, you're thinking to yourself, parathyroid hormone, hyperparathyroidism causes bone loss. And yes, it does. And that's because the body sees a continuous um, level of the parathyroid hormone. With these studies, what they're doing is giving them intermittent little boluses. Parathyroid hormone has a very short half-life, and so you get, a, unfortunately, a subcutaneous injection of the parathyroid hormone every day. And it does cause in, a lovely increase in bone formation. And they've seen over less than a two-year study up to 13% in bone, in bone density. Again, what's the fracture data? We don't know yet. And there is a chance uh, or a, a, a side effect of hypercalcemia that people can develop. So if this does come to market and we do start using it, I only see that it's being used with the specialist because you really have to monitor for hypercalcemia. But this is the effects that we see. They, they use two doses, the 20 milligrams and the um, 40 milligrams, and it shows that there's a, as high as a 13% in the spine. Um, and around a 4% in the hip. And again, fracture though data is what we need before this is really approved. So this is a summary of all the effects so on bone density and the spine is in the yellow and the hip is in the blue. Looking at estrogen, alendronate, calcitonin, reloxifene, uh, residronate, and then also parathyroid hormone. And you can see how they all compare. So what happens with the fr um, fractures. Oh, and I guess before I get there, what about adding something? So someone's already on alendronate or someone's already on hormones and you want to add something. You can see that there's a slight increase in the bone density um, with the, if you add alendronate. But look at the, the scale there. It's only around a 2% extra increase. How is that going to compare to fracture reduction? Probably it's not going to be clinically significant is probably going to be the same fracture risk reduction by one of them as there is by two, both of them together. So I think for cost purposes, you don't need to add two. I don't think we can say two are better than one at this point in time. So what about the outcomes? Again, the fractures, and that's what's going to cause the increase in the mortality as well as the morbidity as the result of someone having an osteoporotic fracture. Vertebral fracture reduction, pretty much all of them have shown a decrease in the vertebral fracture reduction uh, from the estrogen, residronate, the calcitonin, reloxifene, residronate. And then also PTH has shown over that short period of time that there is a fracture reduction in the spine. So that all looks good. The only thing is that um, there's not any, let me go back, sorry. I'll just go here. For every fracture that you do have with, um, that, that does occur, you have an even further increase in developing another fracture. Uh, and so it's real important then to intervene as soon as you can when someone does have a fracture, if someone has not been on therapy. And Residronate has even looked at that one year fracture reduction, or I should say the actinil by Procter & Gamble, they've looked at it one year out that there is the tremendous reduction in the fractures of developing a second fracture, where we know that if you have a fracture already, your risk you know, increases dramatically. So this is, this is something good to keep in mind. We know that fractures result in kyphosis, uh, the protuberance of the abdomen, of course chronic back pain, uh, lung capacity is decreased, and they really get uh, a lot of morbidity associated with the kyphosis and that sort, and of course the pain involved. And then what about the hip fracture reduction? There's only two um, of the agents that have shown a hip fracture reduction, and that's with both of the bisphosphonates. So if we're working in evidence-based medicine, then we have the evidence here, the endpoint data. You know, it's like cholesterol is the surrogate marker for the heart, heart attack, for, for the MI. Uh, and so many of the, the statins only look at your lipids and not really follow out the endpoint. Same here, you know, the bone density is the surrogate marker. And it's really the fracture reduction that we need to see. So again, the hip fractures are reduced um, in both with both alendronate and the residronate. And there's two residronate bars here. One is with and one is without existing vertebral fractures. So we expect, we tend to see more of an improvement in bone density and a decreased risk in fractures the worse, somewhat, the, the worse osteoporotic someone is. 
You know, so if you have more fractures, you, we're going to prevent it more than if someone doesn't have any fractures um, already. And this just shows that even if someone does not have fractures, there is a decreased risk of the hip fractures with the actinil. Um, how much time do I have? I, st I know I started late and we're fine? Okay. I just wanted to go over a little bit about some of the acute vertebral fractures because that's something that um, we don't talk enough about and it's really a problem, you know, when people develop an acute vertebral fracture. Uh, it's important to really apply some good narcotic, I mean, good analgesic. And sometimes it's just non-steroidals, anti-inflammatory drugs may, may be all that's needed. Many times these individuals are totally asymptomatic and they don't even know they had a fracture. So there's a big continuum on how severe or how, how much one, one develops pain uh, with the fractures. Um, but if they do need opioids and narcotics, you know, please give that to them. Um, with the caution um, that it does make them constipated and straining can do more harm than good for someone who's already had a fractures or already has a risk of fracturing. Um, <coughs> physical therapy is important to get involved, probably not so much at the acute phase, except if they want to use some ultrasound and some massage and some heat therapy um, to help with the pain, but definitely um, in the recovery phase um, to help these individuals also become confident that they're not going to then break something else, you know, so that they can be strong again and um, coordinated um, uh, in that sort. And also to teach them exercise programs so that they can stand up straight, do back strengthening, extension strengthening exercises um, so that they can um, really, you know, hold up, hold up nicely in that, and that works and prevents the kyphosis. Probably you don't have to institute osteoporotic therapy, prevention treatment therapy, uh, at that time. You know, it, it does, it's not an acute thing that you have to, or emergent intervention with bisphosphonates or, or the estrogen at that time. You can wait until this pain is over and then institute therapy. It's important to avoid flexion exercises because it puts so much anterior, um, so much stress on the anterior part of the vertebra when someone bends over. And of course, that's the compression fractures that we usually see. Uh, and this reiterates the fact that the flexion of the spine brings those compressive forces on that anterior part of the spine to increase in the vertebral fracture. So what exercises are safe? Uh, walking, of course, swimming, uh, weight bearing with some light weights, um, and these extension exercises for the spine, again, to help in preventing the kyphosis. And of course, that's why we all have to sit up straight and put that back, back. <laughs> so, and what about chronic pain and deformity? And again, that's such a issue. And I saw a lady yesterday in clinic who uh, I, is all hunched over in the wheelchair. She has steroid-induced osteoporosis and it's, and it's just very sad, and her lung capacity has decreased with that. Um, and she's on chronic um, narcotics for it as well. It's real important to try and, and, of course, it's hard to be optimistic when you see some of these ladies, but to really be optimistic that they can get better. Um, and so that you want to control their pain so that they can feel good. Again, depression plays a big part in this as well. They start feeling like they're, they're a China doll. And anytime they're gonna move, they're gonna break something. Uh, and so it's important to build up their self-esteem that way, you know, that they can do it. And um, on top of the narcotics also include an antidepressant. Uh, Again, convince the patient. This is sort of what I said. And so I wanna end with, um, lady that even though it was hard to, to convince her that she was going to get better, that she is improving and, um, is, and is carrying on. So what a smile there. So who should get those bone densities? Again, you know, you don't want to use the word screening, HMOs and that sort do not like that word screening. But there are certain indications and it's very important to include that when you're requesting a bone density to, you know, for the insurance to pay for it and that sort. 
Um, the National Osteoporosis Foundation has set up some guidelines for it. Uh, all postmenopausal women over the age of 65 should probably have a bone density. If they have risk factors, then they can get one if they're less than 65. And so you have to include those risk factors. And I gave you the list, list of those, whether it's the drugs, the factors, or diseases that they have. And so those all are important um, things to include. If they already have a fracture, not to make the diagnosis, and I guess another take home point is that if you already have a fragility fracture, you have a diagnosis of osteoporosis. You don't need a bone density to give you that diagnosis. What you get a bone density for then is to follow if you do intervene to make sure that you're doing some improvement or at least you're preventing further bone loss. So if someone does get a bone density and they're stable, that means that it's okay. You don't have to change therapy. You just wanna make sure they're not still losing bone. Um, of course, glucocorticoid therapy, some of the most profound, horrible osteoporotics I see is because of the high dose of steroids, which again, you have to weigh the benefits and the risks there. But um, it's really hard. And of course, alendronate and residronate are both approved in the prevention and the treatment of osteoporosis caused by glucocorticoids primary hyperparia, and again, to assess response to therapy. I also throw in that bone density. I mean, remember, osteoporosis does occur in men, and so if there is a fragility fracture or radiographic evidence of um, reduced bone mass on x-rays, and now it seems like radiology is really keyed in to call an osteopenia on the x-ray. So if you have osteopenia on the x-ray, you you know, should probably get a bone density to confirm that. And I'm looking at this stuff at the VA. We get a lot of consults for bone density because of osteopenia and just to see if indeed they do have osteoporosis because it's such a subjective call, osteopenia, you know, so that are, are they really, are people now overcalling it because of, you know, lawsuit issues, which I knew of a man who he was, he did sue because of that. He had horrible osteopenia and it wasn't until he fractured that someone made the diagnosis and uh, he he has a case um, for that so which one of these ladies has osteoporosis it's the slide that i always end all my talks with so if you ever heard me before and it's an old slide and it came out of merck's uh, slide collection eons ago they both do it's the same lady one's at 55 and one's at 70. And so it's important that we don't, we prevent people from going from a normal, healthy, upright posture, prevent their bone loss so that they don't become kyphotic in all the um, instances that go with that. And with that, I'll thank you for your attention. I'll take any questions. Yes, ma'am. Oh, you would do that, huh? Well, of course, that's uh, statins and osteoporosis. Um, it's very exciting work that's being done coming out of our institution. In fact, it's my boss. I can't take any credit for it, though. He has, um, he went into the lab and screened thousands of compounds with um, the certain bone assay that he uses to see which compound would stimulate bone formation. And out of all those, believe it or not, lovastatin did. And so he looked at all the other statins, and there was a profound, um, I may have some of that slide, well, but I won't bore you with going through it. But I mean, the rat studies are phenomenal, where you take the rat femur before and after treatment with lovastatin, and there's a tremendous amount of increase in bone density. Um, the trabecular thickness, the amount, et cetera, is all increased. Um, and he's also then used it looking at one of the bone forming um, factors, bone morphogenic protein, uh, looked at that uh, lovastatin's effect on that protein and it increases tremendously. Um, so the theory is that yes, statins block cholesterol synthesis and it also blocks this other pathway of um, phosphating proteins, these other proteins, it's like a side, a side um, track off of it. And I can never say it without having the word in front of me. It's general, generally ill, general phosphate. I can never say it. And I hope, take that off the, uh, <laughs> off the television. <laughs> anyway, it's, uh, so these, these proteins then phosphorylate other proteins. 
And so if we block those, then the proteins on phosph phosphorylated, and then it's a, like a, ne a double negative so that it increases. So preventing the phosphate uh, phosphorylation of the proteins makes it more active, and then it increases the BMP formation. Now what's interesting is that bisphosphonates also have been shown to affect the, the HMG-CoA um, reductase pathway, the cholesterol synthesis pathway, and that blocks as well this um, formation. Um, but it's felt that it doesn't get into the osteoblast, so it doesn't occur, the formation doesn't occur. It just affects the osteoclast, and that's how it causes the death of the osteoclast is by affecting um, the cholesterol synthesis pathway. So it's very interesting stuff, so they, they're sort of linked there, um, but a lot of research is coming out of that. Thanks for the question. Yes? Um, young patients with breast cancer mm -hmm. um, have gone through treatment, which basically they went through early menopause. They mm -hmm. ceased to have their period. Mm -hmm. And they're on estrogen, uh, not estrogen, on tamoxifen. tamoxifen. Um, Why don't you pass the no microphone? No family history. Mm -hmm. um, no family history of uh, <laughs> no family history of uh, osteoporosis. Mm -hmm. um, you put them on, or do you recommend? Yeah. Them well, they definitely need to be have a bone density done in CPR because as a base, I would do one as a baseline. Yes. If, if, someone, if someone's premenopausal and they're going to be placed on tamoxifen, tamoxifen acts as an antagonist in the bone in a premenopausal woman because they have so much estrogen going around, then it acts as an antagonist. Uh, if, if tamoxifen is used in a postmenopausal woman because there's no estrogen, it acts as an agonist and then it, it protects bone. So. Um, I always get a bone density on either either way because that's a risk factor because they really don't have estrogen mm -hmm. uh, in either way. The, the tamoxifen in the premenopausal woman is acting as an anti-estrogen. Mm -hmm. And then based on what their density is, determine whether they should get on prevention or treatment doses of the bisphosphonates. Yeah, because they are at risk. But just to know that many times the postmenopausal woman on tamoxifen will be protected as long as she's on the tamoxifen. So you would recommend bisphosphonates rather than just the calcium and the vitamin D? Mm, again, depending on what their initial if bone density normal is. Normal bone density, you can, you can opt to follow normal bone densities. Mm -hmm. Another thing I usually do is get that marker of bone resorption called an entelopeptide. And if it's high, then I say, well, well, maybe we should start a prevention therapy right now because I know you're actively resorbing bone. At least I can, if I'm a betting woman, I can bet that you are. The markers of bone resorption are used very are used a lot in research studies, and and they look good. But individually, there's a little um, they're not. Although they've been approved and you can use them and get reimbursed for them, um, they're not the end all to be all. But I do use them to make sort those sorts of decisions, and that's with a urine. It's a second morning void entelopeptide. And I think NTL peptides are on the secondary workup slides. Yes, ma'am. For the renal patients, uh -huh. they have um, hypoparathyroidism. Yeah. yeah. And even with that, their risk of fracture is really high to get yeah. this yeah. elderly bone. Um, yeah. Yeah, renal, um, the question was with renal. Um, people with either dialysis, renal insufficiency, renal failure, they all have secondary hyperparathyroidism and have a tremendous amount of bone disease associated with that. The issue is how do you prevent that? And the big thing is making sure that they have a low phosphorus so that it doesn't lower the calcium and increase the PTH and making sure they have adequate calcium. But it seems like that is hardly ever done, hardly ever achieved. Not that, that it's not tried, but it's very seldom that, that you can uh, achieve that. And so then you wind up with someone that has chronic secondary or even tertiary hyperparathyroidism uh, with horrible bones. And then what do you do? 
It's not well studied, and the bisphosphonates are contraindicated in someone with a creatinine clearance of less than 30. Um, so it's, um, it's a, hard, a hard question. I don't have the answers um, um, to that, um, and they need more studies uh, on it. My yeah. Is for the people with the, uh, you said that the last, the newest one, the one that FDA hasn't approved yet, is mm. the parathyroid hormone. Right. So what's that difference? Yeah. The, uh, um, hyperparathyroidism, whether it's primary or secondary, is a continuous level of high PTH in your blood. So, it, it, and, and what's neat about PTH is that it causes both osteoclastic resorption and formation. And if you, un, if you only give an intermittent bolus, for some reason that formation goes up uh, relative to the resorption. But you still need resorption in order to form, but this tends to then allow the, the formation to occur um, better. But yeah, it's it's an I mean it's an interesting concept. But PTH has been around. Looking at PTH in bone has been oh I guess for ten years. Studies started coming out in the animals looking at that, and it's been real exciting. And then the reason why there's only twenty month data in this recent publication in New England in the New England Journal of Medicine was because they stopped the study because the rat models have shown that they increased osteosarcoma, so some some soft tissue. Um, bone tissue tumors. Um, and so then it was like, you know, lawsuits, you know, blah, 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 so stop the study. <laughs> but this still, it has such wonderful results with that increase. Again, we don't know what it's gonna do for fractures in the hip, um, which is, again, it, historically fluoride, increased bone density, decrease vertebral fractures, but increase hip fractures. And PTH is notorious for acting at the cortical bone, which is the hip bone, versus the cancellous bone in the spine. So I mean, it's not, I mean, it's exciting. I'm optimistic, but cautiously with that. In the statins, they'll be doing some um, in, in vitro, uh, in vivo studies with the statins. Um, the thing with the statins, though, it, all its effect after, it gets metabolized in the liver, and so nothing reaches the bone. Uh, so they have to figure out a way to give it maybe topically or intravenously or something so that it could go to the bone and increase bone formation. So the people with high cholesterol right now taking statins, they don't have any benefits? Don't know. So there are studies, I guess there's around 10 retrospective studies that then went back to different um, databases of people starting on statins and then looking at fractures and they're split half and half. Half said they had lower fractures, other half said no. Bone density is all over the place as well. So they really need a prospective uh, blinded study to really look at that. But initially it was real exciting. Bunch of studies, the first four that came out was like all positive. So, but then the next year, the other four that came out were all negative. <laughs> so it's classic in science classic example. So, is that it? Well, Dr. Brewer, I would say with all these questions, we've been paying attention. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just sweet. How about that? Bravo. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs>